Okay, this is the one I was working on yesterday. I'm going to sell it like it is. It's just these little edge touch up real thin. Make a beautiful point, beautiful Dalton. Several other good types of points. Uh, here's one I'm going to work on today. This is a piece of Texas. What I call hill country flint or pertinalis. Make me some platforms on it. I saw the doctor Monday. Uh, see, see it back in two weeks. Uh, did try one medicine and I slept all day, all night and all day. Probably won't have to cut a lot of it out. I don't even know what time it is. I say it's probably three o'clock. This first time I've been out of bed or the chair today. I'm so sleepy now. I'm making myself get up and do something. It's real drowsy. Okay, we're going to try to run one straight across there. There it went. Then I'm going to try to follow this ridge. Already got one set up right here. Sleep my tool on it. Come back and whop it. That one did real good. I want to try. This one right here, but it's got a low area here. I need to bring this part up to this height. Pretty hard for me to do. I just don't have the strength of my shoving ability for pressing the running flakes or pushing them off. I want to see how much and go across here. I hope I can go all the way across there, but I know I can. If I can just get halfway, I'll be happy. The strength's just not there to do it. <laughs> well, I almost got it. I have a lot more than I thought I could kind of encouraging to me I would probably laugh at it but that's encouraging to me There we go. We'll clean that whole area out good. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do anything with this for the night. It's not strong enough to round that, round that corner off that much. I'm going to try to run it right down through here. Got a little of it. There we go. Try to get a little more of it. That's really good enough. 
would like to get just a, one thin plate removal, not thick, just a thin one. <coughs> I'm trying to go straight down there. <coughs> That did real good. And now if we look at this, this side looks good. We gotta come over here and get stuff off of this side and make it feather out to the other side without any hinges or anything. That one did real good. That's the one I said did real good. Now I'm gonna cross this way. There we go. That did good. Now let's see if we can get some of this white out of here. This cortex off of it. Move some material. At the same time. Trying to come right, right through there. Hmm, I thought that come off. Felt just like I felt it in my hand. Again, it might be cracking and hinging. Getting ready to make a big hinge. Is it sure not coming off? I don't know what's going on. There we go. I just don't think I was... I don't think I was keeping... I think when I hit it, I was backing off. Wasn't keeping pressure on it. You get cut, the pieces go in your fingers a lot, and uh, you forget about that. You start getting gun shy, you get to thinking about it. And if I hadn't napped in a while, I don't even think about it. I don't ever get gun shy like that, but, but when I kind of knew it was starting back, I'm thinking, man, I'm not gonna put me some gloves on. Or, I'm gonna get one of them little sharp pieces and have to dig it out of my hand, out of my finger. I start getting scared. I think I'm gonna go right back here. Hold on tight and look at that. How pretty that come out. That will come out real pretty. This one come out good. Want this and run all the way out through here. Want to really do good. Want to cover between my two thumbs right there. <clears throat> Nada. Did not happen. Try again. There we go. 
At first you don't succeed, you try again. That turned out a good bit. What I'm trying to do here is make me a hump right here. And it did it. Now I can come down like this. I was wanting that plate to drive all the way to there and it didn't. But it did turn the hump. Let me try it again right here. And get a good one right in here. And one right there. This one might not do because it's just a little bitty point there. It just took a little bitty piece. I should have ground it a little heavier. Okay, let's look on this side and start working on it. I'm not talking too much, I apologize. <laughs> I'm forcing myself to do this. I keep thinking if I exercise, I'll get better. <sighs> that didn't do good at all. Get too straight in on it. Maybe I can reconcile it by catching this way and this way and getting it out. That did good. That didn't. It's too sharp of an edge. This edge was too straight up. It wasn't turned over this way, and it was real sharp, and it just crushed right there. I should have noticed it when I set this tool on it, but I didn't. That's all it took to get it out. I'd save myself a lot of trouble if I'd have noticed it and done that the first time. Sit down and go back and repeat myself. Now, we've got like a letter... M, or if you turn it the other way, letter W, it's like, like this, right here. So I'm trying to level this off and get a little thick. Let's see what we can do with this spot. Try to run one right up through here. It's not going. Oh, it went, but it didn't go as far as I wanted to. Probably because I wasn't strong enough. I, I think I hit it uh, real strong. I guess in my mind, I hit like I hit months ago before I got weak. And uh, I don't realize I'm hitting as weak as I am. And I think I'm knocking the stew out of it. I don't have a meter down there to tell me how hard I'm hitting it. So we're going to play around here. And we're going to hit it hard. See what happens. That 
Yeah, the problem with it went as well. I felt like I hit three times harder than what I was hitting. Do the same thing there. Yep, I just got to remember I got to hit harder than what I think I'm hitting. That's what it is. Got to get that muscle memory back. You never realize how important the old saying is. I've heard it all my life. You just get sick and tired of hearing it, especially in sports. Your muscle memory. But when I used to do a lot of pistol shooting, shooting a pistol is, to me, it's more muscle memory than anything I know of, man. The squeeze of the trigger the same every time. Uh, remembering, the, remembering the sight picture every time. How hard you're gripping on the pistol every time. Very important. Shooting the bow and arrow is extremely important. Muscle memory. Messing up on this one. I don't know what I've done wrong here. It's just not. It went a little ways and hinged and it's just hanging there. It didn't want him to come out, fall out. There you go, come out. Don't look too bad now. I got a couple good friends in my life who live here in town that believe in the Lord. Terry Perkins is one of them. And Jesus Cotton is one of them. And both of them are pretty much retired. And so far, I've had to depend on both of them to take me to doctor appointments. My wife can't drive too good. Her eyes are starting to mess up on her. And, uh, and they've taken us, all of my pointers have to go out of town. Uh, the closest one is Baton Rouge, it's like an hour and 45 minutes. Terry Perkins took us there Monday. The other other ones are like anywhere from two hours, fifteen minutes, like that. And Julius Cotton took us to one of those. We were able to. I was able to drive myself to another one, but after I got worse, Julius took me. But uh. Man, if you got some good friends, I'm telling you, if you got one good friend, you should consider yourself real lucky. And uh, 
I might not have them. But I honestly believe I got dozens of them. I know I can name probably six or seven more if I call them right now and say, man, an emergency come up. I got to be in California. They would drive me out there if I said I couldn't fly for some reason. That's what friendship's about. You got friends like that. I'm starting to wake up a little bit. I'm going to tell you stories about some prayer. And, uh, I had a friend one time back in, oh gosh, my kids were still in school. I don't think any of them was in college yet. My oldest girl might have been in college. So I don't know what the date was. Lord of mercy. If you've got kids graduating out of high school and one in college now, so that's probably 22 years ago. And I don't, she didn't have any then, so that would have been probably 30 years ago. But, uh, I only said I was one of the first people to start doing this kind of stuff. And I got serious with this business back in. And I was selling bow and arrow blanks. I had uh, bow blanks. I had a connection to some Osage Orange and uh, other, other good wood. And uh, I would run ads in traditional archery black powder, muzzle blast, just ads in back of magazines like that, cheap ads, that I would have bow blanks for sale, arrowheads, stone blade knives, feathers, sinew, hide glue, stuff like that. And this guy contacted me from Oakland, California, and uh, his name was Tim Baker, and uh, he saw where I had a bunch of Osage, had probably 40, 50 at the time, blanks, just quarter split, is what I'm trying to say, just quarter split, and uh, he contacted me and wanted to buy a thousand dollars worth. I ain't never sold over two hundred dollars worth of anything one time. It kind of scared me. And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "I'm gonna go ahead and send you the money." And I told him it'd take a few weeks to get them ready. And he said, "I'm gonna go ahead and send you the money. And that way you have the money when you get it ready." And I said, "You're gonna send me money, and you live in California, and I live in Mississippi." And you don't even know me? He said, yeah. I said, okay. He said, Man, I appreciate it. She did what in no time. About four days, we had we had a cashier's check or whatever in the mail. I went to the bank and they said it was good. And I cashed it. And about a week later, I had all this wood ready. And I, I did stay in touch with him. And, Told him I was working on it and had it ready in about a week and it's no problem. And uh shipped at UPS. UPS was coming to my house at the time, picking up my deliveries every day. And uh he got that stuff and I'm thinking real hard here. That's why I'm slowing down. I'm going to quit on this one. That's another one I'll sell. But anyway, uh, he, uh, I think I'm going to keep this one for nice. After about a month or two, it really wasn't that long. Uh, I got a, another phone call from him. We didn't have cell phones back then. And uh, 
He said he wanted to buy another couple thousand dollars worth. And I remember asking him, I said, man, you eat, you, are you eating that stuff for breakfast? And he just laughed. He said, no, no, huh? And he says, uh, I just like making bows. And he said, I've got a book out on making bows. I've written a book on it. So I got a copy of his book. And uh, we just become good friends. Good friends. Never met him. So I called him up and I said, tell him, I need $60. If you get it to me, in so many days, I'll have you so much stuff in return. And man, I got it so quick, it wouldn't be in fun. And he bought for me for a long time. And one of the things that I really, really remember about it is that I was sitting there watching the baseball game in Oakland, in California, an earthquake hit. It was horrible. And I knew he lived in that area. And it really scared me. So uh, I think I'm going to work on this one now. So I couldn't get him. Didn't have cell phone, just had landline. And I called and called and couldn't get him. Couldn't find out anything on him. I would watch the news reports of the fires and the buildings falling, the bridges falling from the earthquake. And, uh, man, I was scared to death for him. And finally, he got a hold of me. I got a hold of him. I don't remember him. I think he, he was the one when he got line service to let everybody know that might be concerned that he was all right. If I remember the story right, but uh, anyway, we're going to hit a big one right here. Try to knock this off. Didn't work. It's been hitting hard enough. He lost some places and had some damage, but his house was fine. But what I found out, he owned a lot of rental property. He owned a lot of rental property, and especially on the, the uh, ocean there. He had, like, warehouses, people store stuff from when they bring the boats in and things like that. He had a lot of stuff like that. And uh, it's real funny. He was buying all this stuff from me. He'd always send me cash. It always was a lot of cash. He never bought anything on a thousand dollars. And uh, I asked him, I said, what do you do for a living? He said, does it matter as long as it's legal? And I got to laugh and I said, no, sir. And he said, well, I've been blessed to have, to have a lot of rental property. I guess his father found somebody handed him down a lot and he probably continued on with it. And, and uh, he said, I really don't do nothing but manage that and collect the money off of it. And, and I said, well, man, that's great. And then he called me up one time, and he said, I don't know what you have in Mississippi. He said, but it's three of us, and I know I won't get the names right, probably. I think Jim Ham was one of them, and Paul Comstock might have been the other. I think about writing a book. And uh, I want to get every wood available. And I want you to send me one or two pieces, good pieces, best pieces you can find, of all the wood that grows around your house. And I'll pay extra for the trouble. And I said, man, you're not, you're not talking about cedar and pecan and wool and hackleberry and three or four different species of oak are, and he said, yes, sir. And I said, so I'm going to tell you right now, some of that's not going to be no good making bows out of And he said, well, that's why I want it. And I said, why would you want it? And he said, well, we're doing an experiment on the best wood for making bows. 
And then what you can do in a pinch or a bind, like if it's an emergency situation, how you can make it by one that's maybe not that good. And for about four months, I mailed that joker so much wood, I went and bought me a chainsaw. And I got a friend to help me, and we would hit the wood, and we would cut, uh, we would cut hackberry, we'd cut, uh, ash, cedar, cherry, locust, all the types of hickory, all the types of oak, mulberry, Hercules Club, you name it, we had it out there. I'm just afraid this ain't staying up there. To this day, I don't know what he did with all that wood, I'd love to know. He had enough to make thousands of those, but they did come out with a book. Three of them went together, and I don't know if I got the three names right. I never did buy the books, and never got a copy of them. I got out of making bows. I had a lot of books from those guys that was given to me free. I had one of, I went out to Weatherford, Texas at the time where Jim Ham lived, and uh, he gave me a course on sitting you back in short bows, and I got one of his bows. But I started making bows and selling them, about five years, then I quit doing that. I could make four times as much money making knives. I was one of the few making knives, and, and um, I could take and make me a knife and put it down and handle on it and sell it. And a lot cheaper than a bow, and it sell a lot faster. But I could make so many of them, I'd make more money if I sold a bow. And bow making was extremely hard for me in a way because I had no saws or no equipment or anything. I just had a hatchet and a draw and I, the boy, I could pop them blades out of Flint and Georgetown and Buffalo River and sell them knives and customers buy them left and right. And I'd go out there and work in my shop, probably six hours and make more money than I could, working all week making a bow. It ain't like that now, though. They're getting good money for them bows. People realizing what, the, what work's involved in them, all that kind of stuff. Saying that, and how I got off chasing that rabbit, was he turned out to be a great friend. A great friend. I knew I could depend on him. He knew he could depend on me. We were just all the time laughing and talking about stuff, and he was sending me some crazy ideas he had on making bows, and things like that, and, and he, they always were wanting my advice, he, even though I didn't, my name not even mentioned in them books, I don't expect it to be, I think Tim might have asked me one time about, I mean Jim Ham, I know Tim asked me my advice about something one time he was doing on some wood I was me with that he wasn't, but uh, those kind of friends you can get when you get in the sell order, the selling business like this, and over the years you can, that live thousands, thousands of miles away. I've had them that lived in Australia, had them lived in Germany, and just about anywhere else you want to name. I think I'm going to quit on that one. I don't want to take all that out. I want to give you a challenge. I got it down thin. It looks good. 
put over in my cell pile. Right now then, I'm gonna turn the fan on. It's getting a little hot on me. And I know it's hard to hear with that fan running. We're gonna cut it down to two. I'm gonna stop this. I'm gonna call it indirect part one and next would be indirect part two.